other extreme is, hey, I want to keep to myself. I really don't want anybody to know about me, uh, but yet I want the ability to be famous or to get great jobs. So we struggle between these two extremes. So this concept of online identity has uh, has been a has been a big problem. Has been always there since internet was invented, right? And in fact. Uh, On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. It's a very popular meaning. Everybody knows about this. And what that really means is that you can actually pretend to be anything or anyone without the other party being able to verify that. Right? So even if you create a LinkedIn profile and you claim that uh, you, you are a very famous blockchain uh, expert, who the hell knows, right? Nobody actually knows whether you're a blockchain expert or a machine learning expert or not. You can declare so yourself without any form of third party proof. So, so that is the fundamental problem with internet, which has given us a lot of information, but at the same time, um, it's hard to get trust unless through a third party organization verifying that. So identity um, need to be self-sovereign, it requires 10 principles. You can read all about it by Googling it quite easily. Uh, a few of which are like the concept of existence, the concept of control over your own information, um, the ability to access or provide access to such information, and ultimately transparency as well. Because if you claim that you are a blockchain expert or you are a machine learning expert, you know how do you verify that? So identity is also a double-edged sword, as I mentioned. It can be used for beneficial and malevolent purposes. In the case of Facebook, Cambridge Analytica has proven to everyone that your data can be used against you. Right? And of course, uh, identity also only makes sense from a third party um, perspective. We can go deep into the philosophical arguments about uh, I think, therefore I am, but at the end of the day, uh, it is both a philosophical problem as well as a practical problem. So here is where things are changing, right? In uh, 2017, which was just last year, uh, there's efforts to standardize the concept of this distributed ID, which I'll cover in more detail later, and this concept of verifiable claims. How does this you know, tie in with the concept of distributed ledger or the popular buzzword blockchain, right? Um, I'll talk more about it later. But essentially, it is very difficult, the problem that we have right now is very difficult to express your own financial information, your own education qualification, even your personal healthcare data, which is trapped in different clinic and different hospitals' own centralized system, into a way where you control it yourself. Yeah? So the, the, the mission of this uh, W3C Verifiable Claims Working Group is to make it easy to have a standard format, a DID, and a verifiable claim format, which can be uh, consumed and produced by all players in the system in a more fair and open manner. So no one single entity controls everything about you. So the current system works like this, right? You usually have someone, for example, the, uh, the immigration office or the birth and control office issuing um, your identity to you when you're given birth. Uh, when we are born, sorry, okay. when you are born, <laughs> yeah, and to verify that, uh, someone who wants to verify your identity has to go back to the verifying organization, the issuing organization, to prove that indeed you are who you say you are. So this is a circular loop right now, but the problem with this system is that, uh, well, and in the digital system we use this concept of public key identity or infrastructure to solve this problem. But the problem with this, this particular circular loop right, is that it is costly and it's a centralized system. Right? If someone burns down the office holding your records, that's it, it's gone. Right? If, if the database um, that holds all the system is destroyed, what do you do about that? Right? So this is not something that, is, that cannot be imagined. In fact, most refugees who flee from one country to another in times of war flee without their identity because the central organization that can verify who they say they are 
is destroyed in cases of war, in cases of um, disasters. So while we are very lucky to be living in a developed country and most of us do not have this problem, um, there's one billion people out in the world who faces this problem. In the digital world, right, which is also not <coughs> something that wouldn't happen, it has happened, if a certification authority makes a mistake on uh, issuing the digital certificate or the service itself goes down, everything falls apart. Yeah? Your green little lock up on your browser that verifies that, hey, this is a valid cert issued to someone, depends on a central CA. So this is a problem that people don't think about, but when it hits you, well, you're in trouble. So how do we solve this? Right? So one of the ways that people are exploring right now, uh, which is the topic of Hyperledger Indie and Sovereign Foundation, is to take a more decentralized approach to the problem of identity. Right? To do so, it uses the concept of DIDs, right? decentralized identifiers. For those of us who are very used to the concept of UUID, um, DID is a different way of ensuring that each ID issued has a little chance of conflict instead of being issued from a central database. And built on top of a public blockchain, we potentially have a complete solution to solve our identity problem today, right? Which is why I'm excited about Hyperledger Indeed. Um, a bit disappointed that no one else has heard about it, but hey, the idea here is to share about it so that more and more people know about this and potentially consider using such a system to be integrated into your, your own application, whatever you are building. Yeah? Instead of the default Facebook login, the default Google login, hey, look at SSI, look at Sovereign Foundation. So that's what I've covered so far. So to most people, they don't really care about the technical details. So we will jump on to the next part, which is the benefits. Right? That's what ultimately the lay user cares about. As techies, we care about the implementation details. We care about why it works the way it works, how it works, we care about the implementation details. But for most business users, for most lay users, all they really care about is what's the benefits. If the adoption, uh, adoption steps are too tedious for them to do so, well, they will still stick to Facebook login because Facebook login only requires them to tap on a button, okay it without even, even re reading what they are okaying, um, they will get logged in, right? They want to access convenience and the price for the convenience they are paying, they will figure out later, right? So for us, we need to sell the benefits of why we need to do SSI in a clear manner and produce it in applications in a simple manner so that there will be adoption. So that's a huge challenge. That's a non-trivial challenge. So, um, well, can I take the assumption that most of you are familiar with blockchain uh, because you're attending this session? Yeah. So I'll skip some of that part and I'll focus more on what is a decentralized PKI and how every public key has its own address on that ledger. And this is the approach that's taken to solve the self-sovereign identity problem, right? Instead of relying on a centralized organization, we re rely on a distributed ledger shared among participating, uh, validating organizations. Well, it is still somewhat a centralized system, except that the centrality has been spread across multiple organizations. Right? It's a degree of centralization that we are looking at. So this public specification, also by the W3C group, right? ensures that the issuers and verifiers can look can look up the necessary public key on the public blockchain, um, whether they belong to the same organization or identity federation. So, so essentially we are essentially more, you can almost think of it as we are trying to move away from very centralized approach to identity online, which is Google, which is Facebook, towards a more distributed governance, multiple organizations participating in, just like how uh, before internet came about, right, computers only communicate within each other in a central organization, and now we are trying to build connectivity among islands of local area networks, which become the global internet. So this same thing is going to happen to identity in one form or, or another. If Hyperledger, Indie, and Sovereign does not succeed in doing it, eventually somebody will. So that's my prediction. <coughs> So these are the challenges that uh, we are trying to solve right, from a technical implementation viewpoint. We are trying to standardize stuff 
and we are trying to avoid reliance on centralized systems. So this is being solved by W3C. So that is being added into Hyperledger Indie um, by the Hyperledger Indie developers. Because this is an open uh, open standard, this means that if you don't like what Hyperledger Indie is doing, you can essentially take this open standards and implement your own variant of Hyperledger Indie or your own blockchain system that conforms to the standard. And of course, uh, how do we verify it without relying on central CAs, right? So this can be done uh, by having multiple parties being the validating nodes, as you will see in the next couple of slides. And when added to blockchain, the blockchain serves as a open public registry for all the public keys for the DIDs. So this is the core requirements, right? There, there will be a group of governing organizations coming together to participate in this. The performance of this SSI system must be internet scale. Um, to this particular point, we have issues with existing blockchain systems like uh, Bitcoin, which whose maximum throughput is about 7 TPS. Uh, granted that they are building a sidechain with a Lightning Network sidechain, which is supposed to improve the performance. But fundamentally, most of the blockchain system together are, today are constrained by performance throughput. The, block, uh, the, the blockchain by Bitcoin is one of the examples. Ethereum is not much better, even though they are moving towards uh, proof of stake, but their performance is still severely constrained at about 25 TPS. Even if they do move on to POS and increase their throughput to 10,000 or 1,000 or 10,000, that's still very low if you're supposed to support internet scale transactions. It's simply not enough. So these are some of the outstanding problems that need to be solved. Um, I don't think Hyperledger indeed truly solves this yet, but this is one of the core criteria that will eventually need to be solved for a truly global adoption of such a system. And of course, it must be accessible, uh, meaning that not one single organization like Facebook or Google should be the ones uh, controlling your data. And finally, the fourth one, which is the most important one, um, the ledger, whether it is a centralized ledger or a decentralized ledger, one of the core requirements is that it should not be storing your personally identifiable information on the ledger itself. Right? So how do we solve it? We'll talk about that in a bit. So the solution that Hyperledger Indies are threefold. One, conformance with DID, the W3C standard. Two, using a distributed ledger to provide global accessibility so that they themselves, sovereign foundation, does not dominate the whole conversation, uh, the whole control over your identity. And the third one, which is what I last mentioned in the previous slide, is the con concept of verifiable claims, which is a W3C standard combined with cryptographic technique such as zero knowledge proof, i.e. your PII, your personally identifiable information, is never stored on the ledger. So that's where this is going. <coughs> So what is the relationship between Hyperledger Indie and Sovereign? Right? Just to clarify some terminology, Hyperledger Indie is the source code. Right? It's publicly available on GitHub. Anyone can run an instance of it to do development against. Or you could simply uh, ask to be added into the testnet of Sovereign. If you're familiar with the Ethereum testnet, the concept is pretty similar, just that there's a lot less tooling compared to the Ethereum ecosystem. But you as a developer can, be, uh, can ask to be added into the testnet so that you can run your test against the testnet of Sovereign. So Sovereign is nothing but a, an implementation of Hyperledger Indie. And Sovereign is governed by a, an international nonprofit with trustees that are made up of different organizations um, to form this thing to govern who are going to be the real validator nodes. Right? Ultimately, the validator nodes are the one in control. But by spreading control over multiple organizations, you reduce the risk of abuse. So that's where we are going. And finally, um, a public network that are permissioned by stewards, which is one layer outside the, the core governing council. So if, here's how it works in a picture format. You have enough of my words already. So this is how you can visualize it. You can actually find the same diagram on Sovereign website itself. right? Um, all the nodes are essentially servers. And anyone can spin up your own node. You can decide to participate in it and ask to be added as an observable observer node. 
right, which will later lead on to the question on why would I want to know, write, uh, run a node? What's it in it for me to run a node? It's cost to me to be running a server 24 7, right? So that will be addressed much later. Um, but at this point in time, this is what um, the architecture looks like. And as end developers, what we are really concerned about is how do we transact with the validator nodes and observer nodes. So the validator nodes are nodes where when you need a write access, you call an API and then it saves a particular request into the ledger, a transaction, right? Observer nodes are when you need to read particular information out of it. So if we take one step down, looking at this high level architecture, this is how it works. Imagine you are Lucy, a person, you are a claim holder of varying education certificates, uh, your birth certificate, verify, uh, various identifying um, identity, and you would actually get a particular claim that you have issued by a particular party. Right? Once this claim is uh, issued to you, you can countersign it, and this gets transacted into Sovereign. So later on, when an employer asks to verify if your particular education qualification is valid or not, whether it's actually issued by a valid school, right, or it's just some degree mail that turns out a particular certificate for you, your employer can then easily verify it against Sovereign. So this is a flat system that allows you to present a claim without sharing unnecessary information. So when you do this, this is where the zero knowledge proof cryptography happens. Yeah? You don't actually have to share more information about yourself to a potentially employer than you want to. You don't actually have to share more information about uh, yourself to a social network if you don't want to. So that's the benefit of this system. Uh, but for it to come to friction, it'll probably take a while. Now, if we go one step lower, once you understand the benefits of this, and we go one step lower, we can almost visualize our DID in this format. This is taken directly off the W3C website. Um, you don't have to take any picture of it because it is publicly available on the W3C website. And this is an example of how a DID looks like, which is a bit similar to our UUID that we're familiar with. And of course, if you have a verifiable claim, you claim that your birth date is this, your telephone number is this, right? You can es essentially declare this as an entity profile. And right, and get a verifiable claim back in this moment. This is stored in your wallet so that when you do, when someone asks you to provide a verifiable claim, you can then create a proof and send it to him. You create a proof because that proof encrypts your information and shares only pieces of information that you want to share. Pieces of information that you do not want to share will remain private to you. This is an example of how uh, this simple verifiable claim uh, gets encrypted in a JSON web token format. And you can do the same by implementing Anon Crats, which is the library written by Hyperledger Indie, to provide your verifiable claim in an Anon Crat encrypted version similar to this format. Yeah, but for this format, this is just uh, JWT, not Anon Crat. Anon Crat is the, the, the library implemented by Hyperledger Indie. So, I dive in a bit into this uh, concept of uh, this concept of zero knowledge proof, right? So imagine that uh, there are two kids going to Halloween, right? And they are collecting sweets in their buckets. So Alice and Bob are the two kids going around carrying sweets in their buckets. At the end of the Halloween party, uh, they do not want to tell each other. They do not want to tell each other how many sweets they have in their bucket. Yeah but they are competitive. So they want to know, the fact that they want to know is that do I have more or do I have less compared to the other person? So this is the fact that needs to be proved. But they want to prove this fact whether I have more or less without revealing how many I actually have in my bag. So that's uh, the problem. So to do so, right, Bob will actually uh, bucket four different bags Right, so they don't know how, how many, they don't want to review how many, they want to know whether they have more than Alice or less than Alice, but 
they don't want to tell Alice how many he has. So you have four buckets, and each bucket has 10, 20, 30, 40 sweets, as an example. Right? Uh, so these are the four possibilities in our simple, uh, simple illustration of zero knowledge proof. So to, to, to share this information with Alice, but not revealing how many sweets he or he actually has, he creates four locks. Right? Each of these locks will have 10, 20, 30, 40. Right? And then he knows that he has 20 sweets. So he will keep the key for that particular lock and throw away the rest of the keys. Now, Alice, in order to find out whether that's what Alice is asking for, prove to me whether you have more or less than me. Alice, in order to find out whether she has more or less than Bob, Alice will write on four pieces of paper, plus, minus, 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 right? And she will deposit that into the four boxes. Plonk it into the boxes, plonk it into the boxes, plonk it into the boxes. So because Bob only has the key to one particular box, right, which is the 120, he has actually 20 C. Uh, 20 suits, which is why he has the, he only kept the key to that box for 20 suits. So he opens it up, and because Ellie, Alice has declared that she has less than 20, so now, now that he can open the box, he will be able to read this piece of paper that says minus. So Alice has less than, less suits than Bob. And they have successfully communicated with each other telling each other whether they have more or less with without each quoting the number that they have in their actual bags. So this is the concept of zero knowledge proof. <coughs> and when it is implemented as code, essentially you are able to get a piece of fact without needing to know the rest of the facts that, that derive this fact. So that's the concept <coughs> of zero knowledge proof. And so when you combine zero knowledge proof with the concept of W3C verifiable claim, you can then Prove that I actually graduated from Stanford without revealing any other pieces of information. So that is exactly how it works. So the components of Hyperledger ID, uh, this few parts, and anon crack is what I said just now, is the exact implementation of the uh, zero knowledge proof that is on Hyperledger ID. Um, the rest of the system of Hyperledger ID includes the nodes run consensus on uh, redundant BFT. Uh, if you are familiar with different uh, distributed systems, different distributed systems run different kind of consensus. <coughs> yeah, there's everything from rough BFT to um, uh, what what uh, what Hyperledger Fabric uses in their own system, which is actually not a consensus system. It's just a broadcasting system called called uh, Kafka to CODA's own variant of their CODA BFT. So there are many, many distributed consensus systems, including one of the more cutting edge ones that is that seems to be very popular now, which is called Hashgraph. Yeah. So there are many ways of implementing consensus. For the case of Hyperledger Indy, they have chosen to implement redundant BFT, uh, which unfortunately is probably not internet scale. So they might have to reconsider how they're going to implement their consensus. The state um, is managed in Hyperledger Indy using the same concept as Ethereum's uh, Patricia tree. And their storage for each node is implemented using LeverDB. So that's just uh, an overview of uh, the architecture. Um, to me, the only flaw that they have right now is that their consensus mechanism is going to be the bottleneck to support any internet scale transactions. It's simply not possible to support internet scale transaction with redundant BMP, in my opinion. Otherwise, they have essentially nailed down some of the bigger problems re related with identity, which is they are using DID, they are using verifiable claim, they are putting zero knowledge proof on top of verifiable claim. So they have solved most of it, but when you are transacting with your sovereign uh, network, eventually when there's a lot of adoption, you're going to have a problem with performance. So we can easily jump into GitHub, and this is the source code that uh, you can look through. The SDK, uh, what we are interested in, is written in Rust, and 
if you compile it, you will get a shared object. That shared object can easily be embedded into your iOS app, can be embedded into your Android app, and you will basically be communicating with the sovereign test net, or when you go live, you can ask them to add your key into the, the, to the live net, um, and then your Indie SDK will work perfectly. So that's the SDK that you've been familiar with. They have some documentation, uh, though at this point in time, the, docu the documentation is pretty poor. I've done one app on it, and uh, basically I had to struggle through understanding what is what. So hopefully I've summarized up uh, this for you and help you with your implementation process. So this is the summary. And the most important one that we care about if we are not deep diving deep into its own architecture is the Indie SDK. Yeah. <coughs> and the communication protocol that they use is uh, Curve uh, Zero EQ, if you're interested. But uh, it, is, it is documented just that the documentation is not that great yet. Getting there, getting there. So here's a demo code that I wrote in Python, and uh, you can take a look later when you have time, but essentially it wraps around some of the function calls that are built into Hyperledger in uh, and via the SDK calls the network to ask for a verifiable claim, to ask for proof, uh, to submit your proof. So this is probably Lucy from the village of the Philippines. She wants to provide a better life for her family, so she travels to the city. When she arrives, she finds a recruiter and thinks that everything will come through easily. But the paper-filled application nightmare is just beginning. She has to complete a lengthy form to get a job as a caregiver in Singapore, attend a training school to be certified, go for a medical exam, and apply for her passport. At each step, she has to provide her bio data from the start every time. When Lucy finally reaches Singapore, she has to repeat the paperwork process once again to verify her identity. In fact, she could be repeating similar forms 50 times before she can start work. These extra time and effort is due to the outdated system. Like Lucy, millions of migrant workers face these challenges. Their biodata is segmented everywhere. It's time for this process to be streamlined with Kara Ikigai, an application built on Sovereign, a global self-sovereign identity hyperledger. Ikigai helps migrant workers, organizations, and regulators to collaborate seamlessly on the Sovereign hyperledger. Organizations can easily verify identities of the workers and their claims on Sovereign. Even with different employment laws, processes, and IT systems across different countries, Here's how it works. Through the Ikigai Android app, Lucy can establish her identity and age by first proving her birth certificate. <coughs> this is done via the Philippines Authority, who is an Ikigai agent. The agent verifies and validates Lucy's claim and saves it on Sovereign. The agent then issues a verifiable claim to Lucy's app, where she stores securely. With her base identity verified, she can remotely request other agencies to issue her verifiable claims, like her caregiver certificate. Each agency will have a website that integrates with its existing system to issue and save the information on Sovereign. She then sends her verified caregiver certificate to her employer to process the employment at the Singapore Authority. Lucy can share her personal details to different parties and they can instantly verify that Lucy's claims are authentic. This way, Singapore Authority can confidently issue a work visa and it can be shown at the immigration as a verifiable claim. Ikigai on Sovereign is for... Okay, so that was a simple prototype that I made with a couple of colleagues, three of us, over 30 days. In December. Um, the biggest problem with a concept like this is to get the buy-in of most of the regulators. Um, getting educational institutes to buy-in is relatively easy, but ultimately for it to gain wider adoption, essentially you need to have conversations with regulators and government agencies. So in Philippines itself, there's a separate project. Like why, why I talk about all this and why we made a prototype on it is because actually they, they did a sovereign uh, prototype 
with this group of organizations, right? The Bankers Association. Uh, they are this hyperledger member called Amihan, and they collaborated to implement an SSI on hyperledger in the. So this has huge implications on the AML and KYC processes. So if you are in regulatory uh, technology, if you are a red tech startup, uh, this this has huge implications because it's no longer probabilistic estimation of who you say you are using machine learning. You're shifting towards a more deterministic model where it is a verifiable claim. So it has huge impact and opportunities for people in these spaces. Cybersecurity, identity assessment, obviously, uh, regulatory te technology. Um, it impacts how notaries or lawyers will do their work in the future and it impacts how data integration is being done. So instead of 99 organizations all having to separately talk, sorry, uh, in a network of 100 organizations, 99, uh, one organization has to do API integration with 99 other organizations, uh, multiply that by 99 times, all you need is one integration, integration with one single global uh, identity management system. So if they can solve their scalable issue, uh, and they can prove out their zero knowledge proof, I think this is essentially where the future is. So some of the cons other considerations are why are centralized applications like Facebook and Google so successful today? Well, they're successful because they're super convenient to your end user. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to go through what we just went through for the past half an hour to understand what's happening. But it has to be super simple. So how, how then can decentralized systems win? We have to win by being super simple from an end user perspective. So as application developers, what we then have to figure out is how do you design your UI, how do you make it super easy for other people to adopt this. Right, right now, Hyperledger in this uh, indie-sdk source code um, is not really friendly. It takes a lot of effort to know how to use it, so they can do better uh, on that front. But if they are able to do so, and if they are able to solve the performance issue with transactions, we are potentially looking at, well, the conversion of Unix BSD. Nothing wrong with Unix, <coughs> nothing wrong with BSD. Cool. But the fact is that 99% of people use a properly configured Mac OS. They don't want to waste their time configuring their own Linux system. While it is fun, I love it. At the end of the day, when you want to get stuff done, 99% of the people just wants a package solution. So to me, that is the ba biggest barrier to how all this cool technology, which protects our privacy and helps us to balance between giving our data away to get benefits, uh, is going to come true. That's it. Yeah. I have a, I have a question about uh, Lucy. Yeah. So she must, with the app, you know, generate some kind of private key. I assume? That's right. But how is that stored? It's stored locally. Locally? What if she loses her phone? Which creates the possibility and uh, opportunity of having well, third party organizations promising right. to store those encrypted pieces of information. Yes. Yeah. That's another area that I was thinking about, and yes. <laughs> so there are opportunities in a decentralized space like that as well. What about like iCloud? That kind of thing? Possible. Something that's like people <laughs> trust who can choose your trust. <laughs> Possible, of course, yeah. uh, assuming we believe that Apple threw away their private key after everything and stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I have no answer to that, yeah. You're talking about the throughput issue. The what? The throughput issue. Throughput issue, yeah. So, uh, it's a distributed uh, um, architecture. Yes. So, that's bottleneck comes <coughs> Say again? Where the bottleneck is? The bottleneck right now for most system is the consensus layer. So the consensus has latency, network latency, as well as the algorithm itself takes too long to process the transaction, which is why uh, Bitcoin is constrained at 7 GPS. They are trying to break that by creating a lightning network, which is nothing but creating a lot of side chain uh, transactions and getting them into it. So they are still
Like I said, the only way to do something like this is to create a conversation and get people involved. Because each government will of course try to create their own central system. Um, but it is not a all decentralized or all centralized uh, kind of thing. At the end, it will be a means of decentralized systems integrated with centralized systems. Yeah, That's where the future is going to be yeah, in, in my mind. Regarding the government uh, view that this is a 
own territory. That's the hardest problem. And the only way to bring to solve this problem is to have governments target as the validator nodes in this ecosystem. So for an ecosystem like this to work, basically different governments must say that yes, it is worth it for me to participate in the world by by running computers. And how do you incentivize people to run machines on top of as part of the sovereign network? Uh, you can only do that by having a sovereign token, which is what they want to launch. Uh, the company behind this is called Ethereum, it's a US based company. Uh, sovereign foundation is non profit, but to incentivize players participating in this, essentially, at the end of the day, money talks, and we need to create some sort of economy balance within the ecosystem. That is why we are intending to launch a sovereign token. Without sovereign token, no one will be interested to run a computer as part of this network. there is an item added to the agenda, which is a blockchain and an open discussion for people who really want to see uh, what the future for open source free software is for blockchain. Um, so we invite everybody to stay around for this. I think Martin is going to help uh, lead this session. And anybody who wants to participate can move up closer. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Christopher. Christopher. Yeah.
have to blast it. Get rid of the main tank. <laughs> So everybody listening, come come closer. Yeah. Right? Everybody I'm just gonna have a so have a chat. Right. No microphone, no presentation. He doesn't bite. <laughs> you, you, you don't, don't want it to be recorded. Um, uh, you can record uh, uh, um, it, but I don't. It might think be messy. I would. Yeah, record. probably. Uh, definitely, the picture is not gonna make any sense because <coughs> just gonna, yeah. Come come closer. Well, I've got this microphone. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we could do Captain House rules. Captain House rules. Yeah. Or we don't like. Discuss what's discussed, or who discussed it. Is it going to be controversial? Okay, um, yes, I don't it'll know. be controversial. I have a lot of controversial <laughs> things to say. You have controversial things to say. All right. <laughs> um, okay. Um, just to give a very quick introduction, I've been hosting these sessions um, in Los Angeles and at Faustan in, in Brussels. Um, in order to um, to get a little bit more discussion about uh, what is the relationship between free software, open source, and, and blockchain. Um, from my own perspective, blockchain is kind of dominated by token trading, by investors, by people trying to make money, people trying to... Uh, um, to uh, um, start some, some business or something like that. Um, and it's not really focused on solving problems um, and um, helping uh, the world make a better place, essentially, which is what free software and open source uh, uh, wants to do. So I want to um, collect uh, the free software, open source focused people in order to to get more focus on that. Um, we started it at, at FOSDEM with the idea that we want to have a blockchain track at FOSDEM. Um, and I have then been working on um, getting a blockchain track for other conferences. And um, as, as it turns out, uh, FOS Asia is actually the first conference that has a successful blockchain track, which had so many blockchain talks. In a, in, a, in a free software conference that I haven't seen before. Um, probably if we check the history, FOSS Asia may be the first conference with a large blockchain track, um, which is great. Um, so yeah, uh, um, um, at the past events we had like uh, collected about uh, 30 or 40 people who are interested in this idea and trying to build an online community where we can share and communicate um, and um, so maybe what we can do is we can uh, um, do a little bit of introduction. Everybody um, give a short introduction about uh, yourself, what's your connection or interest in blockchain, um, and then we we go from there and see what happens in the discussion. Um, do you want to start? Sure. Um, my name is Christopher Adams. Um, for blockchain, I'm mostly working with the hardware side um, from China. This company came in. Um, which really doesn't, they have released a lot of things like open source free software. Uh, but for my, my own work, I'm more interested in some of the applications you can build on top of blockchain. Um, things like proof of existence, which is one of the first non-financial applications built on Bitcoin blockchain, where it's embedding data, like a file hash in the blockchain in the op return. Um, what else, what else can I say? Um, as far as open source stuff, what I'm mostly working with is like the Bitcoin node project, which is a you know full node wallet, everything um, that's built in JavaScript in Node.js. So there's basically two. If you're working with Bitcoin, there's the original Bitcoin Core C C++ application, but there's another version in Node, which I think was written to kind of increase the accessibility of this. But it's very hard to find developers. Um, they get hired away you know, to companies. Uh, they stop looking at the GitHub projects. And they're sort of languishing a little bit. And I feel like there needs to be an injection of really good, young you know, Node.js developers who can kind of pick up the mantle and keep these projects alive. Yeah, uh, yeah my name is Nicholas. So I work for a company called Proteus Ops. We gave a talk uh, today at 
and under. So uh, you might hear also me. So we, we do the business and this is about my mom side of the company. Uh, recently we have been getting a lot of requests for ICOs and we recently did an ICO for Hot Token which you mentioned. So I think yeah, for myself I just want to learn more about blockchain and ICOs. Well, I'm just collecting knowledge and getting understanding more and more deep about the uh, how and who, who are the practitioner, what kind of aspect, uh, limitations, everything that will, you know, seeing, tracking the progress and yeah, basically gain more knowledge about the blockchain. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I am Kenneth, and then I have uh, project, uh, project Meetup in Singapore, and then right now, uh, every month we have uh, some topic. And then I try to invite a technical speaker or come to my meetup and just talk. So right now I really invite. Last month I worked with the uh, trade union in Shanghai. <coughs> that we have a talk show and then a real call and then so they can meet YouTube. So in the future I want to do more more meetup event invite more speakers to come on my up because I don't want to be a speaker again. <laughs> yeah. So another way is we also create another page to teach people how to learn the project. Yeah. So this is my purpose. Uh, my name is Paul. I work for Cost. It's a Yes. Okay. Um, I'm James. Um, I'm here with my co-founder Ben. Came in here from uh, the U.S. actually, and uh, we're visiting because uh, we have a uh, dev center in Vietnam, and we are in the process of uh, kind of transitioning it into a focus on blockchain applications. And so um, we're uh, uh, also our company's called DevBlock, and we're doing some work around uh, putting a developer's work on the block for accountability and also just to show people that hey this is the work I've done and here's how I got paid and so we're evaluating some ideas around uh, the Singapore ecosystem so and I'm just with the James I'm a single I'm a software engineer in Singapore in the e-commerce field uh, for the last couple of months uh, I have investigated and tried studying about blockchain and have been to a couple of meetups there are a lot of kind of uh, interest in Singapore on blockchain, so I was kind of uh, getting into blockchain and to know what it can do and go uh, uh, My name is Kaik, I, uh, well, I used to be a developer and I'm a business fan of hybrid. My interest started because I'm part of SOSP, that's the biggest VC accelerator in the world, so I mentor startups globally and some of my startups started doing SEO, so I had no choice but to pick up. <laughs> Uh, eventually, have been part of successful startups in the region, helping them uh, with some of their fundamentals. And recently joined as a partner in one of the top blockchain economics and gardens companies uh, in North America and Europe called Prism. So, provide, I mean, I help wise mentor in terms of blockchain. Um, I mean, I understand the tech part, obviously, and I understand the business part. And I help kind of consult or advise in big picture governance and companies. Um, my name is Faisat. Um, I'm here skeptical of the snake oil. That's really it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Dia, and I'm currently just a student uh, studying computer science in SUT. And so basically, I'm just here to gain more knowledge on blockchain and just want to. 
basically learn from everyone else who actually have a lot of experience in this area already and just want to see what kind of possible applications and what kind of possible problems can be solved using blockchain. Hi, my name is Cherry. Uh, my background is in systems programming. Uh, I'm interested in peer-to-peer -peer systems. Uh, and I'm also kind of keen on the possibilities for the blockchain to kind of address some of the transparency issues which I feel at this point are completely on their head. And I, I kind of, I'm a fan of uh, Julian Assange's statement that transparency needs to be directly proportional to power, whereas the blockchain is going to be up right now, and I'd really like to see what the opportunities are. There are some discussions uh, uh, yesterday at the panel <coughs> Uh, in the direction of sort of using blockchain for uh, demonstrating a chain of trust uh, for ethically sourced uh, products and services and so on. Uh, so I'm quite keen to understand a bit more about that. Uh, my name is Edwin. Uh, I'm a business architect. I uh, in, in the uh, hardware tech field in semiconductors, previously corporate. So now I'm in the, the education field. Uh, in one of my projects is to mentor startups and uh, helping them to cross the chasm and then scale up in Asia. Hello, my name uh, is Fong Zhu, and you can just call me Rebecca. Actually, I work uh, I, I work for the same company as Marty. <laughs> But however, actually, um, my previous experience, well, I worked for Elastos um, from 2003 to 2006. At that time, we were working for a, a proprietary uh, desktop operating system. Uh, then I left the company, and then I worked uh, uh, for many years for mobile phone design and smart hardware design. Um, early this year, I rejoined the Elastos Foundation which is the company that Marty and uh, I worked for, worked for and working for. Uh, <coughs> later on, I can, if you are interested, I can just uh, share some of uh, the vision and the latest uh, progress of Elastos uh, development work. And when actually we, we have already uh, launched the ICO uh, late last year, and right now we have our main chain published. Uh, right now we are working for side chains and also the uh, Elastos framework for uh, for the app. You're just coming in time. It's your turn for introduction. I'm the crypto ledger curmudgeon. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we, I have a software development group in, in Thailand and uh, been very interested in crypto ledger for a long time. Been avoiding doing ICOs until recently we did a client hot now com out of Thailand and we raised a million bucks. We're launching it on Stellar and uh, I've done stuff with Ethereum, Stellar, and evaluated several others and uh, have a very uh, strong opinions about the direction that development's going on the blockchain. Right. So my name is Martin and uh, as uh, uh, Rebecca just said, um, we are working together on Elastos and um, I have a uh, background in the free software community. I've been working with free software and with Linux for more than 20 years. And so um, free software is, um, how to say, dear to my heart. And that was also the reason why I joined the project. I was specifically invited to join the project to help the project uh, um, with the free software um, aspect of it and uh, integrating the project into the free software community. And um, so because this project is using blockchain, I naturally also had to pick up uh, something about blockchains. And so I realized that um, there's a disconnect between the blockchain world and the free software world. And I'm trying to help with that disconnect to um, change things up a little bit. OK. Um, I don't really have a, a plan where to go from here. Um, maybe um, we can start off with a question of what do you or what does anyone think about um, 
what a free software focused blockchain community would look like and what would that actually mean? Um, or, um, yeah, does anybody have any idea to that uh, question? Ethereum project is a big free software project, right? Um, well, yeah, okay, but is it, is it a free software project or is it just a project that is happening to use free software? I mean, that that is the, the thing. I'm not sure what you mean, how are you differentiating? I think probably what you mean in my view, I don't know if it's called me, if I'm wrong, but I think what you mean is basically something whereby somehow everyone can have a say in how the direction of that software should go, can vote, whatever, have a suggestion. Um, like what you said, there's software that's free that, let's say, Ethereum LNs uses, and there is free software where you can basically suggest a change. Let's say a lot of people think you have it, it's a good change, implements, becomes part of that, and that happens to be a decentralized ledger or whatever. Is that what you meant? Or? Um, maybe, well, actually, um, I just thought about it. What, what I'm thinking of is uh, um, a, a free software project is a project where the values in the project are driven by the ideals of free software. And um, I don't see that with most of the blockchain projects. So ideals is in like GPL? As in GPL, stuff. as in sharing, as in uh, um, <coughs> um, freedom for the users. And um, so Ethereum as a base may be that, but most of the projects that are running on top of Ethereum are not. Right. Well, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, 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 so <laughs> that's so that so that's the question. So, what what is it? What are the ca characteristics of a project, or what it, what are the ca characteristics of a community uh, where the focus is free software, where the focus is? Uh, so, so I, th I think I think what is, so what's common from the ones that I've seen is that they have they they do tend to establish uh, nonprofit foundations that, that govern the thing, right? So, so Ethereum has done that. Um, Python community has done that. You know, a lot of other right. projects have. Um, our client is actually establishing a, uh, a, a nonprofit foundation that's going to own the IP for the system and will own a certain number of coins and is going to distribute coins in order to encourage people to adopt that, that token. And um, Stellar Project has has done this, and they're giving away 90% of their coins. So I think you see, you know, maybe that's it's not a prerequisite, but it's a mm -hmm. common attribute of, of these kind of things, perhaps. Okay. Any 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 other thoughts? I mean, free software is you know it's a license in a way. There's not one you know governance model right. project. So then you're getting into more politics and technology. How do you run a community? Which is a different challenge. Right, but but free software projects are all kind of driven by this common idea of